Welcome back, everybody. It is, let me see here, November 19th. Um, I am here today with Cliff Schechter, there we go, and Brian Klotz. Hello. Oh, didn't mean to make Brian the, <laughs> and Brian yeah, Thumbs down, I mean, we're just meeting him, John. <laughs> Screw <on>. that guy. <laughs> Brian is a uh, professor at U of political science at University College London, a uh, very august European university, although I don't know if we consider it European anymore. We'll have to talk about that um, after <laughs> Brexit. Or, or if they ever consider themselves European. And um, Brian's going to talk to us today about his new book, Corruptible, Who Gets Power and How It Changes Us. Um, Brian, I mean, I don't know, Cliff, let's just jump in. I, I wouldn't mind you telling yeah. us about the book first, and then we can chat a little bit right. about how we're all So who gets about. the power and how has it changed us? Yeah, tell us about yeah, this book. So yeah, so I'll tell you about it. So I basically, what I started my career, my academic research is studying dictators and despots. Um, and one of the things that I think started to become clear to me as I interviewed these people, because I, I, I've met a lot of former dictators and despots yeah. around over the years. Um, wow. and, and one of the things that became clear to me is that there's personality traits in them that are actually echoed, I think, in people that we know. Um, yeah. that are obviously in smaller arenas of power and, you know, the homeowners association, the DMV, mid-level management, Congress. Um, so what I, what I wanted to do is I wanted to figure out sort of two big questions. You know, one is, does power corrupt or are corrupt people drawn to power? And the other is, does power actually change you, right? Does it actually, and so to, to figure this out, what I did was uh, I sort of had two approaches. One was, I interviewed about 500 people, um, and many of them were people who should not be in power <laughs> from cult <laughs> former cult leaders, bioterrorists, psychopaths, criminals, uh, corrupt CEOs, generals. You must have and, quite a Christmas list. Yeah, exactly. I mean, ge generals and military juntas, the whole, the whole works, hmm. right? Um, but then I also did a lot of research based on things from evolutionary biology, neuroscience, political science, okay. behavioral economics. All sorts of stuff, and I put so it all together to try to nurture of dictators. In essence, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, and and what I'm what I was really trying to figure out is, you know, the power corrupts tagline is I think quite unsatisfactory because it's not actually the whole story. I think it's a very very small part of the story. <laughs> so the way I'll introduce this is with a, a quick story that I have in the introduction of the book, which is a, a lot of people have heard about that Stanford prison experiment where the the professor put everybody in prison uniforms. Yeah. And the guards started abusing people. Even what made a movie. Get, actually, which, I, I'm sure. I, I said they I, even made that into a movie, which I'm sure some folks who yeah, didn't I'm, know I'm about it probably familiar with, I'm not familiar with this. Could you explain this real sure. quick? Sure. Yeah. So if you haven't heard of this before, this is in the 1970s. A guy named Philip Zimbardo at Stanford recruits some, some students, puts half of them in the role of prison guards, half of them in the role of prisoners in this fake jail in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. And very quickly, the prison guards start abusing their fellow classmates. I mean, wow. doing horrible things. And so the big takeaway from this, and it's a pod in intro psychology textbooks around the world, is that, you know, the uniform changes you, the power changes you. Now, what I found that hasn't gotten much attention, I think is a nice way to introduce some of the concepts in the book, is a study from 2007 where these researchers took the exact same recruitment ad. They said, you know, we want you for a study of prison life. They ran the same ad updated for 2000s prices, you know, so you get $70 a day instead of 15 bucks a day. Right. And then they just changed the ad in half the towns to be for a study of prison life. And for the other half was for a psychology study. And what they right. did, what they found was that in the, when they said for a study on prison life to become a prison guard, basically, right. the people who responded to the ad were basically worse people. They were Machiavellian, narcissistic, authoritarian, abusive personalities. The people who studied, who responded to the generic ad were not. They were representative, more of the general population. And so one of the core arguments of the book is that power is magnetic to corruptible people. It draws them in. And so then you have to think about the systems to counteract that effect. And I think huh. that's a huge part of what I spend the better part of 250 pages exploring why that happens, who gets power, hmm. how it changes people, and how you can actually fix the process. That's fascinating. Although, can and, I, and I mean, yeah, go on, Cliff. Yeah, go on. No, I mean, I, I was going to say it sounds incredibly convincing when I think of studies of history and looking at sort of some of the folks who choose to put themselves in that situation, choose to run for office. Um, I mean, it, it makes a lot of sense. It follows. It doesn't mean, you know, we've, we've seen some people that obviously once they get there and they have that power, they completely change. Right. Um, but who, who is first attracted to it? 
I, I think, I mean, it's, it, that's fascinating. And, and, and maybe this is too big of a question to ask because it may be all 365 pages or whatever of your book, but, but power doesn't always, uh, the corrupt don't always win, right? I mean, you've got countries, okay, A, America, right? Up until now, at least in our recent memory, things went pretty well and then they didn't. Um, in lesser countries, <laughs> not going to name any so people don't get upset with me, Sometimes you had bad people. Sometimes you had Let's good say people. Different countries, John. <laughs> I know, but you know, but I'm not going to say different. I, I really no, but I mean lesser in this case. That's why I'm not naming even categories. But I mean countries where you would think democracy might not be as good of a foothold, or, or okay, the democratic, so lesser democratic, or the democratic guess, culture. Yeah, or the democratic culture. You sometimes have good people. You sometimes have bad people. Um, is it is it a matter of in every situation, America to the worst? despot, you know, Libya or where or worse, uh, North Korea, bad, the bad people are always, the corrupt people are always attracted, but the institutions are able to stop them or the public or? Yeah, that's, it's a perfect question. So, so basically you've got an interplay between the individual and the system. Um, and you also want to be sure of what's actually happening because if a corrupted person gets power, you shouldn't change the system to fix it. You should change the person. If a system is causing people to become corrupt, you need to change the system. So diagnosing it is really important. Now, I, I talk about a study in the book where I think it illuminates this question really well, where what they did was they said, okay, you're going to roll a dice. And if you get a six, you know, every time you get a six, you get some amount of money, but you get to self-report your own scores. So you can write down whatever you want. So you can lie, Right. Now, what they did when they did this in India, and they saw the people who were lying, the people who had all the sixes, one guy even put 42 sixes in a row, right? He was this audacious. <laughs> those, those people who were cheating- Donald Trump! Yeah, so in India, so in India, the people who were lying, they're also the people who wanted to join the civil service because that's where you get bribes, it's where you get kickbacks, et cetera. When they reran the study in Denmark, it was exactly the inverse. It was all the clean people wanted to go into the civil service. Hmm. So this is one of the things that I think is really dangerous about modern US politics, where you know, we, we, we fit in this story, is that you, know, you think about what's happening in the headlines right now in the modern Republican Party. You have you know, Paul Gosar and people like him getting away with things. You have school board members facing death threats for doing basic acts of public health. You know? And you think, okay, who's going to be attracted to that system? Well, I mean, right. the worst people, right? right. I, I think that's the real problem is that when the system is rotten, the, the, the rotten people get drawn to it. And even if you design a better system, there is still, unfortunately, an effect that power has on people's brains. The neuroscience is pretty clear on this. That it, I'll just sorry, I'm just oh, waiting for that. The, <laughs> the neuroscience. Actually, can I just say that's like that normal is, police? I thought. Do you not have the crazy police sounds that the Europeans have? That's, that's the ambulance. So there you go. Yeah, oh, okay. Because it's like eh, 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 in France, it yeah, freaks so, you out. Yeah. But so I mean, I think this is one of those things where you still have to counteract the effects of power because it is. <laughs> it does actually change your brain chemistry. And I talk well, about that. There's a chapter on that in the book. I want to say, because I don't think I was very eloquent in what I was trying to say before. So let me try again. Um, that is what my worry is. And we talk a lot about this on this show, which is we had a democratic culture. It doesn't mean we didn't have authoritarians of all stripes. Obviously, the way the South was run until recently was authoritarian. But when it came to our national politics, you know, the culture of of, of who looked up at you know the models in front of them and what chose them to want to run for office and all of that, you know, made it so that we you know we we had at least we had some great figures. We turned people that maybe weren't always great figures into great figures, and so people wanted to go into it for the most part. I think for the right reasons, and really in the post Nixon era, and people start souring on government. I think and all, but it's obviously been on crack since Trump. I've said this for a while now. Like the Republican Party. You know, and, and how they elect people now, has be, it seems like it's like they've become flypaper for the worst among us, the most corrupt, the most extreme, the most conspiratorial. I mean, if you looked at that current crop right now, who would run? You know, what I mean, you just you're not going to get people, even if I don't particularly love their politics, you're, you're not going to get many Mitt Romney's or Lisa Murkowski's. You're going to get I mean, look at Ted Cruz yesterday, who, you know, Joe Biden says he, he's going to Nantucket. And his response is to retweet him and say there once was a man from Nantucket. I mean, that's what we've got yeah. now. People looking up to Josh Hawley. And I mean, I, 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 maybe you can answer this because there is a question at the end of my, my long blathering here, which is really, I don't know how once you open that Pandora's box, how you get back to having a democratic culture that sort of, you know, 
that that I'm trying to think of the right way that that sort of pushes forward the kinds of people you want in office that celebrates those kinds of well, people. Well, can I can right? I put a finer point on it? it uh, very, and we told the story before, so I'm not going to tell it long. At Georgetown, we had a professor who was telling us about sort of cultural violence in the Middle East. And once the assassination started, I think it was late '60s, early '70s or so. You had Jordan, you had a couple other places that there was a fear of it instilling a culture of assassination. Correct. And sort of the same thing. Have we have we now not opened Pandora's box? And we're trying to uninvent nuclear weapons, so to speak, by saying um, we have shown how corruptible our system is. Ha ha. Corruptible. Um, we've shown how corruptible our system is. And now how do we make it less corrupt and get less corrupt people to take over? Yeah, so it's a great question. So the first part of what you were talking about, Cliff, with the sort of undesirability of power in a way, I think is really important because this is where I bring this down to the local level. Even I have I, I interviewed uh, people who have had amazing run-ins with homeowners association petty tyrants who uh <laughs> fantastic stories of we've, we've all had those that's, that's funny yeah. though that's yeah. funny and and the reason i bring that up actually the reason it's not because it's just a funny diversion it's actually because it teaches us a lesson which is no, that interesting yeah you know, like who wants to find your neighbor down the street if their trash bin is out four minutes too late right the right. only people who want to do that are the people who are drawn to power now in public service and good <clears> systems there's a, uh, there's a thing that balances that out because you think, okay, I'm getting the benefit of public service. I'm serving my community. I get some prestige along with it. Maybe this is worth it, right? It's, it's sort of worth the, the burdens of power. Right. But now when it comes to death threats and violence right. and you, know, you have to constantly uh, you know, placate lobbyists mm. and all this stuff, it's just it's basically meant that the people who are good and decent in our society are no longer drawn to power seeking. The people who are awful in our society are. Now, how do we counteract that? So the last third of the book is talking about how you redesign systems and how you attract better people. And I have 10 different principles, which I won't go into the full detail here, but you have to think about from the very beginning. OK, in every system, and this is true of good systems and bad systems, Power hungry, rotten people are disproportionately drawn to power, disproportionately good at getting it, and disproportionately good at staying in power. Okay. Then take that as your given and redesign the system, which we don't do. How do you now, redesign the system? I mean, can I, I don't mean that. I don't mean necessarily your details, but how do we redesign? How do we manage to do that in a country like this? We can't re we can't even re redesign the voting laws. Yeah, I mean, so I think the U.S. case is, is slightly different from the broader picture. So I'll talk about the U.S. case, and then I'll talk about some of the broader principles. So, okay. I mean, in the U.S. case, the problem is, and I think this is why I'm quite pessimistic over the short to medium term, right. is that... So we're one of the things, lesser countries, is what you're saying. Well, we're, we're in trouble. I mean, we're in trouble. And I, I think the reason we're in trouble is because I can't see a circuit breaker in the short to medium term with That's, the political culture yep. on the right, right? So, so what I mean by that is when I've studied authoritarian cultures and countries around the world, you know, the thing that often works to bring a party back from the brink is electoral wipeout, electoral defeat. Okay. Now, that's difficult to do when the party has already gerrymandered. It's difficult to do when, uh, you know, the media narrative around the people who actually listen to the media is Fox News, right? And Fox News is being drawn further to the right by OAN and Newsmax. So, right. you know, another way of having a circuit breaker is a massive crisis. I mean, we had January 6th and 750,000 Americans just died and it made the problem worse. Yeah. So I think we're in, we're in a real very, I mean, it's a very serious problem in the United States. Now there are ways though, that you can make people in power behave better. So, you know, for example, one of the things that I talk about is the principle of rotation and better recruitment. These are two very simple ideas, but they work really, really well. So in police forces, for example, when you rotate partners, you get far lower rates of collusion and abuse because you huh. don't trust that the partners got your back all the time, right? You're, you haven't been working hmm. together for 15 years and think, right. okay, they're in on it, right? Huh. They'll, 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 they'll steal you know, just as much as I steal and they, we won't report each other. And there's lots of studies that show rotation actually makes a massive difference. Hmm. Recruitment for candidates is hugely important, right? Now, in the U.S. context, the problem is the, the base. It's not, it's not actually the candidates. It's that the base wants, in the Republican Party, in gerrymandered primary districts, you're looking at extreme politics. So there's right. not much you can do there. But in our society more at large, better recruitment is, is crucial. I mean, I, I talk about this in an area that's tangentially related to what's going on with U.S. politics, which is our police recruitment. And, you know, I, I spend a, about 10 or 15 pages in the book looking at this juxtaposing U.S. police recruitment against New Zealand, where it's done much, much better. And basically what I looked at is there's, you know, there's this case in Doraville, Georgia, this town of 10,000 people outside of Atlanta, where the recruitment video is basically 
the Punisher logo followed by guys in a SWAT vehicle, a tank. <laughs> attacking grenade. black people. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's like, and it's like, it's a town of 10,000 people, right? There's a, oh my God. there's a police force in a township in Indiana that has an amphibious assault vehicle. And there's one body of water in the whole county. It's a pond next to a farmhouse, right? So oh you so never you know when about... a couple of frogs are going to grab too many lily pads. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you got to be ready. Yeah, and so I was thinking to myself, okay, like, like, let's imagine you want to be a community police officer who just serves the community. You see that website and you're like, okay, that's not for me, right? So what New Zealand did is they made a very glitzy comedic recruitment video that portrays policing as uh, fun, funny, and caring. And the logo at the end is, do you care enough to be a cop? And actually the perpetrator they're chasing throughout the entire video is a dog who's stolen somebody's purse, right? So if you juxtapose that against the tank, the Punisher, the smoke grenades, right? right? And right. The Punisher. And what they have, you know, in the end is they had a massive increase in the number of applicants from non-traditional backgrounds. And they said the personality types completely changed. Right. right? So it was the altruism versus, versus I want to kill people. Exactly. And so I think, you know, my, my point is that, and I think I, I make this clear in the book, is that none of these individual principles are going to be a silver bullet. Okay, recruitment and retention are they help, but they're not going to solve our political culture problem. It's yeah, can you I, before you move on, tandem. I'm sorry, but before you move on, so give us an example though, in a, a maybe America won't work, but how would you then put that into practice? How would you put that into practice in politics then? That kind of example, like the, the cop example in New Zealand. Well, what you, what do, you do is you'd have much, you, you, what you need, for, first off, what you need to do is you need to make power safe, right? I mean, I think that's super important. That is actually very relevant for the US because Meaning? I Meaning that I think that if you have to weigh up whether you're going to get harassed or face death threats or anything for being oh. in the public eye, okay. then then good, decent people who aren't power seekers are just going to say it's not worth it. They're going to bow boards, out. boards, things like that. Yeah. Yep. And you also have to reform the system in the sense of like, you know, I, I'm sure there's plenty of people listening to this who have thought, oh, I'd like to run for office in the United States. And then they start to do a little research and yeah. they think, okay, I'm going to need a million bucks. Everything yeah. that's ever happened in my life is going to get raked through, right? We yeah. need to make power palatable to people who are generally good, decent people, right. but don't want to have all of the burdens associated with it that are, I think, unfair and unrepresentative of what the job actually entails. Is that possible, though? Is that not Pollyanna? I'm devil's advocate yeah. you, though. But is that not like, yeah, great, great idea. But again, you want us to uninvent nuclear weapons and we're not going to have the, the press rake you over and the right wing rake you over? Well, I think I think we can. I mean, for example, money in politics. I mean, is it realistic that in 2021 this reform is going to get passed? No. But I mean, every other democracy on the planet that that works doesn't have our problem with money in politics. And I think it's a massive deterrent to people who are not drawn to fundraising, self-promotion and to self-aggrandizement. I mean, I, I think that this is something where these these issues are solvable. I mean, there's also things that we can do in terms of thinking as political parties about who we want in office. You know, I think I think some political parties occasionally don't recruit as deeply as they could, especially in areas that are, you know, less fertile territory for their electoral prospects, and it hurts the party over the long run. So I think, you know, recruiting good candidates who just be, they carry the banner of your party for a very long time in the community, over time, it makes politics better. Now, I don't think any of these things are a silver bullet, right? I think that one of the things that is, is a reality is that the U.S. is in a serious crisis right now. And I think it's because the political culture has been so warped. Um, I also right. think there needs to be accountability. I mean, one of the things that's really important is, is, and I talk about this a lot in the book, is that, you know, people's behavior changes based on a risk reward calculation of how much they feel they're being watched and scrutinized and how much they think the risk of consequences are going to affect them. And I think that the more that we have impunity in the United States for people who are behaving in ways that are, I mean, Paul Gosar would get fired anywhere in the United, if he was outside of Congress and he did that, uh, tweeted a video of him killing a colleague, he would be fired in yeah. any there'd be a loss. There'd be a massive lawsuit too. I would think there'd yeah. be a lawsuit too. Yeah. 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 Well, that, so, that brings so, me kind of, well, hold on, I'll let you, I want to let you finish, but I want to bring up what I think maybe a circuit breaker could be. So go ahead, sorry. No, I was, I was just going to finish the idea by saying that I think that these things are, they're not rocket science. They're just, they're tweaks that end up in aggregate making a big difference. And I think they can actually make a big difference because the United States used to work and it could work again. Okay. Yeah. I mean, no, I, I absolutely agree. So, I mean, for me, and, and this is where I spend a lot of my time on the show and Twitter, wherever writing, you know, one of the big circuit breakers to me seems, it seems could be the mainstream media. And I, I, and I say that, and I'm always careful to not be like enemy of the people or any, I mean, look, I write a column at the daily beast. 
I, I don't, you know, I can be arguably called the mainstream media. It's not like everybody, but the overall narrative, the overall focusing on one goofy thing to the detriment of everything else, the fake balance, it, it harms us because in the end, if people don't have honest information, they can't make good decisions. And democracy relies upon that. And what really drives me nuts, and Mitch McConnell with the money, with you know this kind of stuff, he pioneered some of this stuff years ago and we realized, well, if, if the two newspapers in my state, Louisville Courier Journal, Lexington Herald Leader, actually lean liberal, if they're only going to editorialize against me every once in a while, but then the mainstream media, when they cover in the news, they're going to both sides everything. So I can lie, I can promote, you know, I can ignore the Constitution and not do advise and consent on a Supreme Court justice. I can do all sorts of things like that. And then I can drown out any other voices with all of this money. Then, I, you know, I'm never going to have to to answer, you know, to, to anybody. And so to me, if the pressure on the left, center, wherever you want to say is enough, and, and it's coming now, starting to come from people inside the mainstream media, right? Mark Jacobs, who I guess used to be at the Tribune, and I think was an editorial guy has been talking a lot about this, how the media has failed. Because to me, I'll just sum it up. If you can get away with saying crazy right-wing stuff to your base, but then regular folks who are sort of maybe Main Street Republicans, whatever you want to call them, never have to hear about it or know about it, this is the dance that they get away with because mainstream media won't just say what the truth is. They have to balance it. That, to me, could be a circuit breaker. And yet, we still we, we get some great John Harwood refuses to play that game anymore. Like there are some folks who have just stepped out of it and are like, I'm not doing this anymore. But most still are. And I, I feel like that is harming us. Almost irreparably. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're right. And I think you're diagnosing a problem, especially in the right wing ecosystem, which is that they are being pushed right by OAN and Newsmax, where the Main Street Republicans yeah. never see this. But now Fox News is seen by Main Street Republicans and they're getting <laughs> more extreme as a result of this, right? Yeah. right so yeah. I, I, we have a ratcheting effect. Um, I think that one of the things that I that that also speaks to this, which is something where, you know, I, I explore this at length in the book, is it's turning the mirror back on ourselves. And I don't necessarily mean, you know, the three of us, but I mean, why is it that so many Americans are drawn to such awful leaders? I mean, that is, I think, a more profound wow. question that we have to grapple with. And so one of the things that I look at is, you know, it, it's got roots that are beyond the headlines. So, for example, there's a whole realm of, of scholarship uh, in a field called evolutionary psychology. And what they're basically saying is humans have been around for 200,000 years. Our brains are basically the same as they always have been. But our lifestyles have changed massively in, say, the last 20 gen generations. Right. So what they're saying is you know, it's, it's the, the, the sort of Stone Age mind inside right. of our modern skull. Uh, right. And yeah. Now, what does that do to us? Well, it means that, you know, when you have a figure like Trump, there's actually an evolutionary reason why if somebody manufactures a crisis, you know, the American carnage speech, and then says, I alone can fix it, that taps into something that's in our subconscious. Because mm -hmm. in times of crisis, we tend to gravitate towards strong men. I mean, it's literally, that's, the, that's what the term means. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Trump is not, you know, necessarily physically strong, but he's a large male. <laughs> and, he's and, definitely not and, physically and, strong, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, I'm this sorry, is, I'm being a jerk. Go ahead. Be no, but it's, I mean, it's, it's something where, you know, Putin he is a strong man. Trump photos. is absolutely a strong man. Personality yeah, yeah. and charisma. And I mean, we don't like him, but he's, he, yeah. he's boisterous. He's, yeah. yes, I always he's, say corporate, he plays the role. I always say corporate boardroom, Cliff. That's the example I always give is who could you imagine being in an old style corporate boardroom with a cigar and the whole Trump? Right. And well, I think, you know, I Putin's, even, Putin's no, the no, same way, I was Brian just going to say. Sorry. Yeah, go. Yeah, Sorry. Putin, yeah I was just yeah. going to say, Putin's the same way. I mean, you, yeah. he, you know, he's shirtless and he takes these <laughs> yeah, photos. But, it's like, you know, imagine imagine yeah. a CEO doing this to sort of inspire the troops. I mean, it's insane. But it taps right. into this mentality. And, and there's lots of studies that show this where you, you prime people and say, okay, you know, which leader do you want? You know, things are going fine. The economy's growing. And then you have a different group and you say, you know, it's, there's a time of crisis or there's immigrants coming in that's or there's a war. The leaders they select in those simulations are different. Oh, that's and so, you know, yeah. I, I think that there's something happening with our media and with our, 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 you know, citizenry that is actually deeper than just the sort of back and forth Republican Democrat battles that we have to acknowledge these stupid cognitive hmm. biases if we want to counteract them. Hmm. Well, I, I would say quickly, I mean, you know, you bring up evolutionary biology. I've always sort of believed in, I don't know if you read work by Drew Weston, The Political Brain, you know, and he went a lot into sort of, yeah, we have newer, you know, 
newer ability to reason, right? The newer cerebral cortex on top of the old stuff still there, the fight or flight, the, and this is what they tap into it in, in times of crisis, you know, and what worries me the most is, you know, when people say, oh, you know, with Trump or a classic example, oh, he's just a buffoon. He's just a, you know, and I'm like, you guys should have seen, you need to read how the New York Times was writing about Hitler in the 1920s. He was a failed artist. He was a buffoon and everybody else was like this clown. You know, and, and the people, everybody's like, okay, don't don't bring up the Nazi example. More recently, I think of Idi Amin, who everybody thought was a buffoon. But it's the buffoons who ignore those social cues. The rest of us say, like, I can't say that. I can't take a picture shirtless on a on a horse. They do that stuff because they lack the shame the rest of us have. They've got that strongman instinct and they tap into that thing. And so the buffoons are who we actually need to be the most scared of, is what I would argue. I, I think that's right. I mean, I've I've said this to people throughout the last five years that I think if Mitch McConnell tried to do the same things that uh, that Trump did, people would actually be more alarmed because they'd say this is a strategic actor who's rational. And right. so, you know, whereas with Trump, it's like, oh, he was just joking. And, you know, all all of us are understanding, no, this is not a joke, right? This is actually happening. But a, a lot of people who are not right. active political, you know, engaged people think, oh, he was just, it was just a tweet. You know what I mean? Ryan, let me ask you with that though. Then are we falling into the trap? It's not really a trap because you have to address it, but by talking about January 6th, by talking about Trump, by having this discussion with you today, are we not feeding just justifiably feeding into a culture of fear and panic that per se makes voters say, well, gosh, in that case, I want a Republican strongman. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a fair question, but I think when you can accurately diagnose actual crises, you still have to respond to that. Right? No, I agree, but I mean, but I mean, is there is there? I worry that there's an element of the very discussion we're having and the panic sure. we're all having as as I wouldn't even say Democrats as good Americans because good never Trumpers too, but that we're creating a situation where the public at large goes, "You're right, things are falling apart. We don't elect a liberal Democrat for that. We elect a conservative Republican when things fall apart." Yeah, well, it's, the reason why I think that I mean. I think that there are certain people who are mo more predisposed than others to that message, right? I think there is a divide in our society of who's going to be much more susceptible to the strongman argument. And I think those people have already been captured, basically. I okay. think that those people are already drawn to Trump. They're already drawn to Trumpism. And I think that the, the actual, the reality is that there's more Americans who are not, right? I mean, that's, that, okay. that's the good news. I think that in this situation, because it's institutional threat, in other words, it's the system itself, you have to sound the alarm. I think that when people, you know, if people made an, uh, a Nazi comparison about something related to policy or taxes, you know, that is hyperbole because we have those yep. debates are normal. But I think that when you have comparisons about authoritarian movements that strip away the democratic character of the country, you actually have to be aware that, that you know, the U.S. came close to something very, very serious on January 6th in the sense of, uh, you know, a real concerted effort to put somebody who lost an election into power. Right. And that is the definition of an undemocratic country. So, I mean, I, I think that this is something where you're right, we don't wanna be trying to prime people and we also don't wanna, but it's also, a, it's a supply problem, right? I mean, in other words, if the Democrats had somebody running who was a strongman figure, then I'd be more oh. worried about this. But there's yeah. no supply, yeah. right? There's yeah. on, on the left, the, the alternative is yeah. Joe Biden. So it's like, and potentially Kamala Harris. So I think it's one of these things where you're like, Okay, yeah, I could I could see that argument if the supply was also a strong man on the left, but it's not. So well, I think but a lefty strong man could be more effective. I don't I, when I say strong man on the left, I don't mean somebody who's a tyrant, but does that mean on the left in times of crises we need someone, man or woman, who's more of a kick ass that the public well, goes, I, mean, I like let me, them. Bernie. Let me answer your question because I was gonna say yeah. something for a second on that, John, which is I mean, a classic example to me, that's John's dog, by the way, Brian. That's my dog, sorry. Hi, yeah. sometimes. Yeah. Um but but um, but I think of FDR. I mean, he wasn't a tyrant, but he spoke with the confidence, you know, and the ability to get up and project strength. And and oh, I would argue that Democrats need that. In in other words, no, not an actual strongman, not an actual dictator. I mean, some people would say FDR had a little bit of it in him with the court backing and some of the other things that went on. But but he had the confidence of who he was and what he believed. And I feel like we need that much more to have candidates of that ilk yeah. when we're in a time when people feel unsettled. Yes. Yeah, I, th I think that's true. I think that there is, and there's there's some stuff I do talk about in the book that that taps into this question of certainty in the time of crisis. It's not just strongman mm -hmm. figures. It's also people who have visions. 
Um, and I drift briefly into a discussion, which I think is, is interesting, but it's a bit strange of meerkats and African wild dogs and how they use uh, certainty. Well, now I'm definitely reading certain book, certain like, by the way. Are they the, are they the like stand yes, up? Yes, exactly. And, yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So no, but there's, there's, this, there's amazing research because they have different approaches to how they try to convince their followers to, to move. Huh. And, you know, in, in some, in some species, it's literally just the, the alpha says we go and they go, but in others, there's sort of the, the act of confidence how much certainty they, how much uh, determination they issue the move call with actually really matters. And so I think there's some of that in humans. I think that we have a, a level of uh, panic that happens during times of crises. And some people are drawn to strong men in that figure, in, in that instance. Other people just want someone who says, I have an answer. I can that's actually right. fix this yeah. problem. And I think that, you know, that's where vision and that goes into the political brain and some of these other ideas that have been around for a while is that vision is crucially important to good leadership. Hmm. I mean, you have to show people where you're heading. Um, but I also think that, you know, you know, this is a moment of it's, it is a moment of profound political crisis in the United States. And I think the idea that any one individual is going to save us, I think, is naive because I think that the system is is really what's wrong right now. And and I, right now. Let's, I mean, let's only because I, I keep trying to like hurry because you scare. I think you told me you only had 45 minutes. So I'm like, oh, shit, we got to get back to Brian. Um, tell us some things we can do. Don't tell us things America can't do. Tell us some things America can do that maybe can make things better. Sure. So first things first, I mean, as an individual. Read Brian's office, book, I would start with, obviously. Uh, there you go. <laughs> Corruptible. Yep. Is, that's right. I mean, the first thing, you can run for office in, in your local area. I mean, I think this is something where, I know it sounds trite, but it's actually something that isn't happening, uh, where I think increasingly good, decent people are not doing this, and they're, and they're uh, opting out of it. I think we can push for serious reform. The Democrats, for example, are wielding power right now, and they're doing very little to reform the system. I think another issue is you need to get rid of gerrymandering. I mean, gerrymandering is something that's so corrosive to our system. And it's not just for the obvious reasons, right? It's, it's for things like when you think about whether politicians actually have empathy, whether they care about people who are affected by their decisions, we've engineered a system with gerrymandering where they only have to care about their supporters. Because most districts, in the 2016 uh, election, the average margin of victory was 37% in house races. So a 70-30 landslide was pretty much the, the emblematic case. Now, if that's the case, what are you gonna do? You're gonna listen to the Republicans if you're a Republican and the Democrats if you're a Democrat, because you can't lose a general election. Your only worry is a primary, yeah. Yeah, all, your only worry is a primary. So what do you do? Okay, well, you, you've just put the corruptive influence of power on steroids, because now you just you view the other side as an abstraction that you don't even have to think about. That's true in our media hmm. silos too. Now, these are big things we have to solve, but hmm. Democrats can start doing this, right? They can start by voting reform is obviously crucial to it, gerrymandering reform, massively important, and actually finding ways to hold people accountable for criminality or corrupt behavior in the Republican Party. And I think that is something that, you know, has just been woefully inadequate. This is slightly unrelated to my, to corruptible. It's more interest, more um, my work on authoritarianism. But when I've traveled around the world and studied the breakdown of democracy, the rise of authoritarianism, the places who act too late, they often never recover their democracy. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to rebuild a democracy. Protecting one when you have the warning lights blinking red and you have power, I mean, that is a good situation to be in yeah. if you're willing to exercise it. And the Dem you know, this would be a different situation if the Democrats didn't have the Senate, the House, and the White House. But they do, you know, and I and I think this except, is also well, except where we don't because of mansion and cinema. Well, yes, but I mean, I think on some of the issues, they'd be willing to come along on things that are still positive. And I think, I think this is also where you need to have, you know, some wily tactics that are willing to get things over we the We need line. to be what willing to things? step out. That's the problem is so often we get caught in the, well, it hasn't been done that way before. And yeah. we're staring in the face of people that ignore laws, rules, norms, and there are things we can do to respond. And I've said the only time in the last decade I can think of where I've seen anybody respond in the Democratic Party with what was necessary was when Harry Reid got rid of the filibuster for lower judges and because McConnell was blocking him at such a level. And he was like, this is ridiculous, you know, and, and, and that we finally did something about it. Every other time that they've stepped over the line, we've just sort of we slap them on the wrist or don't do anything. Yeah, and I think you know the idea of protecting the filibuster while democracy dies is the absurd uh, yeah. situation we find ourselves in, right? Like, yeah. let's have this rule, this arcane rule in the Senate, but then let's have 
you know, the min- minority rule for perpetuity. It's just, it's a bizarre state of affairs. But I do think, you know, one, one of the things that I do talk about in the book is this idea of the dirty hands problem, where sometimes politicians to do the right thing have to get their hands dirty. This happens all the time in politics. And I'm not, mm-hmm. I'm not condoning it, but, you know, Abraham Lincoln wheeled and dealed in order to end slavery. <laughs> he basically used right. political kickbacks to do this. I mean, Winston Churchill during World War II let ships get sunk by Nazis, even though he could have warned them because he didn't want to give away the Enigma machine codes and understood the bigger picture. I mean, I think at some point you have to say when you get to these levels of power, you want to have the the absolute big picture in the front of your mind. And this is where I watch the Democrats now. And I think, you know, these people who are worried about being branded as a partisan, it's like yeah. you, you're going to be gerrymandered yeah. out of your district. Yeah. You know, like you're, you're not going to have a competitive election. The election officials are going to be some crackpot who thinks yeah. that, you know, Donald Trump should be president right now. And meanwhile, yeah, no, you're trying no to sense. pander. Yeah, I mean, it's just so there it's, are things that can be done. Most of them okay. are at these uh, they're at the elite level and they're Democrats. Let me uh, ask you something, though, because your yeah. research had. OK, y- your research has shown you ideas for going forward. Has your research shown you I- I'm going to keep harping on this point how this is effectively done. What I mean is I still feel like we're not able to do it in America in terms of when it works. How have they been able to get these reforms through? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So one of the things is creating coalitions around democracy. Um, so this is something that I think is very difficult in a hyperpolarized society, but is necessary, which is to say there are Republicans who don't believe in Trumpism, who do believe you know, in Reagan and Romney style politics, and they need to be on board. And I think Democrats really, I mean, this is where I think I probably break with some people on uh, the progressive left on tactics, is that I think that if you end up in a situation where you alienate the people who can create that coalition to protect democracy in order to pass a policy, right. you've made a very bad calculation. Because the system itself has to be democratic for any of these policies to actually- You're, you're, you're singing to the choir here, Brian, because yeah. we're so, all of that yep. mind of like, I Ms. will join Cheney. with anybody to the far left of me, all, yep. all the way over to to right wing. You know, Joe Walsh yep. has had somebody we've had on the show who we I love Joe Walsh. now. <laughs> yeah. I disagree with him on on yeah. on everything politically, yeah. and yet it, you know this is it. When you're talking about saving Maybe democracy, everything else comes second. Yeah, everything yeah. else. Yeah, you, you know, but uh, go. there's examples of this, by the way. I mean, this is something that happens when in, in some of my field work or countries I've studied mm-hmm. around the world. There, there's clear evidence this works. So, hmm. in the Gambia, it's this little spit of a country in West Africa inside Senegal. The dictator rigged elections forever, and the opposition was splintered. And the, hmm. the dictator specifically sowed division among the opposition so that, you know, it was a one-two punch. You've got a rigged election and you also have an opposition that hates itself. What they finally did uh, several years ago was they just said, you know what, we need to get rid of this guy. So they said, we're going to have one unity candidate and the dictator still rigged the election, but didn't rig it enough. He didn't, he he miscalculated and he lost. Wow. And, uh, and he's, he's an exile. Now, so we have to hope and... that Republicans in Texas count as badly as that guy did. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> exactly. Well, that's, I mean, that's, that's the reality of it, right? Is that there's sometimes you, you can, you can, the, the Republicans are trying to rig the system with gerrymandering, but if you beat them in, in large enough numbers, it's not going to make enough of a difference. We, I mean, I think can we fix gerrymandering at the federal level. That may be a cliff question or either of you, or does that have to be a state issue? Well, I think there's there's parts of the voting rights proposals that would try to create legislation that would then get challenged in the courts about okay. whether you have fair districting principles. Okay. Because I yeah. think there are elements of gerrymandering that I would, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but I would I would believe have reasonable constitutional challenges. Yep. Uh, Abrogate your civil them. rights. We would have a yep. good shot if at least if the court, you know, if it gets to the Supreme Court, of course, with what they've done, who knows? But if it's if the court actually judges it by our principles. The yeah. big one to me right now is, and I, yeah. you know, I always disclose this. You know, I wrote ads for the Biden campaign, so I say that I throw that out there so people know. But in, in this case, I'm going to be saying something maybe that people wouldn't expect of me, which is, look, I love Kamala Harris. I think she's she's great. But Nixon, we're back when he's in office. You know, I'm trying to remember when he was vice president under. They declared some of the the rules in the Senate to be unconstitutional. And in our system, the filibuster does not exist in the Constitution. Kamala Harris is right as somebody who presides over the Senate to declare rules unconstitutional does exist. And when you're talking about wily things like what you're saying, this to me seems to be one of these things where it's like she can do it. And I don't know how long it's going to take or what it's going to take to get her to do it. But we're getting closer here to, to, to the, you know, end times of democracy. Uh, she needs to just 
obviously declare the filibuster unconstitutional. And I mean, that's my opinion at this point, because I don't know what else we have left. John, I wanted to give you one other answer. I, 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 think, I think that this is something where you're right to be pressing me on it. Um, and this is, it's an outside the box idea, but I think it would also act as a circuit breaker. There's this thing called sortition, which is not going to happen anytime soon in the United States, but it's a principle where you have random allocation of people in power. Now, I don't think this is going, this is not going to happen, right? I know this is not going to happen, but the Greek, ancient Greeks used this. They used random lots like jury duty to figure out who would be in a citizen assembly. I don't think we should do that. What I do think we should do is I think we should make a citizen's assembly that exists in parallel to Congress, where 435 members of the House are randomly selected from the population, and they decide on, say, 10 big ideas with no binding power. Now, the reason why you do this is because it forces Congress to say, why didn't you come up with the same solution that 435 decent, normal Americans came up with when they were trying to yeah. figure out what to do about infrastructure, right? Because it's it's not because it's they're going to have some power. It's going to say right. something now exists, right? You can have this in the business world where you have, you've got a board of directors, you have a shadow board of employees. Yep. That's the same number randomly allocated. They don't have the same pressure on them for quarterly profits. They have right. a longer term vision and they produce a similar report. And at the end, you can you know, a journalist could say, wait a minute, you know, when we put Republicans and Democrats in a room together and right. told them, here's the problem, they came up with a, a reasonable right. proposal for infrastructure. Why didn't mm -hmm. you do that? Right. It would put There's a group pushing for this, Brian. I don't know. If, hmm. I'm trying to think because I got an email from I'm on somebody's list. There is a group that was created that's pushing hmm. for something like this, um, but I can't think of their name right now. Yeah, well, I think I think what's different from my proposal, I've seen lots of these groups that have sortition on their agenda. And I think actually the idea is bad if there's binding legislative power. And the reason for that is hmm. I think politicians actually develop skills. So I, I think they develop expertise. So the, the proposals that I've seen are just are replace the Senate, replace the right. House with random. But that's never going to happen anyhow. Yours right. makes a lot more sense in a yeah. practical sense anyhow, because the other things, I mean, come on, yeah, right. we can't even get basic stuff done. The other thing never happens. Right. So, yeah. But I just, you know, I, I like to think when I talk to people, I, there's family members and friends that have different political views from me. But when we sort of sit down, OK, admittedly, when, you know, when Trump comes up, it's sort of it's difficult to get through that conversation. But when it comes to something like infrastructure or like, you know, should we do something about climate change? Now, of course, there are some people who just say no and aren't willing to engage. But the overwhelming majority, I think 70 percent of Americans can sort of see that, OK, we could actually solve some problems. What should we do? How would we do that? And, you know, again, it's just forcing that conversation because right now it's like they just sort of vote party line and that's the end of the story. But they but you know what? But you're taking what is interesting about your proposal is you're taking out the money in politics. You're taking out the lobbying and you're also yep. taking out the special interest in terms of trying to get the vote. If you're asking me to figure out infrastructure, I don't know. Also, how the party. He's taking out like the, the okay, I just too. vote this yeah. way because of my party. Right. Because yeah. I don't have you're right. I don't have my party leader. If I'm in this pseudo Congress, I don't have my party leader telling me how to vote. Yep. I have no idea how an infrastructure program affects my mom's district in Illinois. And that's great <laughs> because because as a congressperson, then you're definitely going, shit, how does it affect my district? Uh, regular people don't have any of those influences, which is very interesting. Yeah. That's precise that you you've hit the nail on the head. That's yeah. what I want to what I want to do with that proposal. If it were ever enacted, something mm -hmm. like it were ever enacted, the entire point is that it would expose the effect of all the things that shouldn't exist in our politics. Yeah. Gerrymandering. You know, the, the difference between what yeah. citizens do and what the yeah. politicians come to would be lobbying would be money, would be partisanship, right? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So it just, it would force that into the open. It would just, and, and the same would be true in companies, yeah. right? Like if Enron mm -hmm. is embezzling money and they say, wait a minute, we've come up with a different budget as a citizen or a, right. you know, an employee board, you have to explain the discrepancy. Why are you it, pumping money yeah. into this? Imagine asking, Democrats, imagine asking Democrat and Republican politicians from across the country, politicians, I'm sorry, citizens across the country, what to do about gerrymandering. They would be united because they'd all be afraid of the other guy cheating. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, we'd have an we'd have an answer, I suspect. Well, and there are there yeah. are some states that do that. There are some states that use citizen assemblies to draw maps and those ones, they they, they tend to work better. Yeah. I mean, hmm. I, I think also, by the way, you have to think about engineering systems in a way that acknowledges that some of these problems actually require some intervention. So 
gerrymandering, drawing districts for a specific reason could actually be good if you maximize competition, right? In other words, there are some there are some places where if you just have geographic districts that are purely you know blocks on a map, right? Well, that's actually not going to be great either because we've sorted ourselves demographically. So you have these super blue and super red areas. I would think that what you'd want to do is you'd want to draw districts that maximize competitiveness in order to ensure that politicians have to be responsive to both sides. The only actually absolutely. Have to, Okay, yeah. I agree with you, but that look, Ocasio Cortez isn't going to like that, and uh, Gosar isn't going to like that. I don't. I'm not comparing the two. What I'm saying is, Bernie Sanders on the left has a lefty. She has a lefty constituency, so you can't tell her you you're going to be devil's advocate. We're going to put you AOC in a district where you've got to suck up more to conservative Democrats and moderate Republicans. Well, then you're saying we can no, we can never have an AOC, and we can never have a take a conservative Republican who's not a nut job. I'm not sure I can think of one right now, but take one, then same thing. They wouldn't want to accept it either because it's, oh, well, we can never be Reagan Republicans. We have to be Jim Jeffords Republicans. But I think, I mean, so it wouldn't completely replace that, right? There still would be, there would still be a spectrum ideologically. Right. If you It'd be impossible maps, to get rid of every competitive. district that has. I'm yeah. just throwing it out there. Just, I'm saying no, like, you're, I, you're, I you're totally right. Back. But I'm just, I think the change would be reasonably marginal. Instead of something like 15 or 20 House seats that are actually in play each time, right. maybe we have 100 out of 435. Right. Right. But all of a sudden okay. that gives less veto power to a right. few, a very small number of moderates who actually care. I mean, you know, okay. the reason why Democrats are upset with Joe Manchin is because he can't get real elected unless he panders to many Trump supporters in his state. And that's true of a lot of House districts uh, in, in, in moderate places, but not in the AOC districts where they end up saying, OK, uh, I don't care about anything on the other side. And that's certainly true of Gosar as well. And I, I think our politics would be better served if we had politicians who feared losing general elections, basically. That's I think well, that would be that's a the whole principle behind, yeah. the, behind the system, right? So I would agree yeah. 100% with that's that. That's interesting. Yeah. Right. Hmm. And Cliff would disagree about the Manchin thing. He would say that Manchin is not going to win re-election, so he shouldn't be sucking up to the right, and it's not clear what he's doing other than being well, corrupt as hell. I think doing an electoral analysis <laughs> is that is that yeah. he he hung on admirably uh, in the West Virginia last time, but lost a lot of support from the previous time. And if you look at kind of the ebb and by Bob Kerry kind of story in these states, you know, people who are elected and then lo- he's not going to win next time, probably. And, right, and right. maybe he should Which be makes it more like offensive he understands what that. What he's bingo. But it makes but, it more, he's less of justified in terms of trying to, anyway. Um, now, again, I'm happy to have you keep going, but I saw you look at a clock. Do you have to go soon or can you no, talk? No, five minutes is great. Okay, good. I mean, okay, but tell us more. What? So what else? That was one great idea, sort of the citizen alternate Congress thing to propose ideas. What else can we do that actually could be done in a system like ours? Yeah. So, I mean, some of this stuff is slightly abstract, but one of the things that I talk about is this this idea of the weight of responsibility. And it was what I was talking about with the media idea where politicians don't have to ever encounter the consequences of their actions. They they often make decisions, end up hurting people, and then never see it. And there's a lot of psychological evidence that that is way easier when you are distanced and psychologically distanced from the people who are being hurt. So the way I explore this in the book is I interviewed uh, two very different people who approached this problem. One was John Yu, who wrote the torture memo for the Bush administration, the lawyer out in right. Berkeley. And the other was uh, Ken Feinberg, who oversaw the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund. And what really struck me about the two of them was how they approached their job differently. So Feinberg, he was you know, basically using a mathematical formula to figure out how much money to award to, to 9-11 victims. But he, compl- he, he insisted on meeting every victim. Every victim's family, he wanted to sit with wow. them, hear their story, talk to them. And he said it crushed him, right? It was like, it was horrible. But he's like, I'm not going to give a dollar amount to the value of someone's life until I've looked them in the eye and talked to them and sort of been able to understand what this is actually about. You know, I asked John Yu, what was it like to think about the fact that his legal determination had led to people being waterboarded? Mm-hmm. And he was like, eh, I didn't lose any sleep over it. You know, it was an abstract legal decision. I mean, I would, uh, you know, I sort of just thought about it from the legal perspective. And I thought, you know, maybe he would have thought about this slightly differently if he'd gone to a black site, if he'd seen mm. some of these things. You had happen. to watch it being done. Interesting. Yeah. Exactly. And, and he, you know, I pressed him on this for ages. I kept mm. saying, like, you know, I've made academic arguments, but like, if I knew they were put into the real world and somebody was tortured, potentially wrongly in some, some instances, right. I'd feel bad about that. And he just wouldn't give mm. an inch on that. Now, for politicians, I think the problem is that, again, this goes back to things like gerrymandering and media frames, because they don't have to care about people who are on the other side. 
we have to we have to find ways to make it so they actually do see this. And I think we need more citizen assemblies. We need more town hall meetings where they're confronted by people who disagree with them. I mean, the modern politician, especially in you know the sort of C-SPAN era where you you know, address an empty chamber, then you go on Fox News, then you go to a rally. I mean, they never get exposed to people who disagree with them. And, and I think on a psychological basis, that's deeply uh, counterproductive because power already is making them more callous. I mean, there's lots of neuroscience evidence to suggest that without any sort of empath- uh, empathic um, counteraction. And so, you know, we have to think about those things. We have to make sure that politicians... I, are- I think politicians on the left are confronted by that because the right wing is very good at that. The On the right is not because we're not. We do not confront right wing politicians and drive them crazy. They scare the hell out of our politicians and they have for years. Obamacare, remember every well, issue... Some, some of yeah. it's their, you know. their, their superior messaging machine, but yeah. some of it's also... And that we've talked about, we need to counter, but some of it's also they're willing to do things that we would never do, like threaten people. Yeah. Like send Go out the Congress and anim- like send out <laughs> anime videos of their colleagues. Yeah. Yeah. Their, you know, I mean, like, which which leads me to another question I want to ask you, Brian, because you're you're sitting there, of course, in the United, you know, in, in United Kingdom in a in a different situation in terms of the laws that, you know, that we have here. We basically let you say and do anything. We're we're First Amendment to the extreme. I've talked about that on this show. I'm a writer and and talk and do all these things I, I you know for a living I actually care strongly about the first amendment but over there the libel slander laws mm-hmm. are such that people are held much more accountable for spreading disinformation for lying about public figures for I've often said and yeah. people argue with me on this one too that I think we would benefit from more from having the laws that you have over there because I think it at least puts a dent in the disinformation and the attacks and conspiracies that can be shared do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, what's really interesting as I mean, I've lived over here for 10 years. Um, and what struck me is that the relationship between the print and the airwaves media is basically flipped. So hmm. the airwaves media, which is to say TV and radio over here, for the most part, is mainstream centrist, very, very reliable, doesn't hmm. have partisan agendas. Huh. The print media is is hyperpartisan. Um, and so, you know, you have the left wing paper, the right wing paper, et cetera, right. and there's constantly libel, uh, lawsuits going against the sun and other, you know, sort of tabloid media and so on. And, and I think that that's something that's, that's, it, I mean, there's many reasons why that's the case, but one of them is this, this sort of, you know, fairness doctrine that exists in, uh, in the airwaves media where you have to give some semblance of balance and you're also held accountable by a regulator for truth. Hmm. Um, you, you, you can't just openly lie all the time huh. and not get, not get held accountable. Now, I mean, I think there's profound debates philosophically about whether this is a good or bad thing, but I do think that it's obvious that individual voters are going to make bad determinations if their information pipeline is poisoned. And I think yeah, that's I what's happened. I mean, you know, one, one definition of democracy is informed consent of the governed, which is to say the people who are affected by a government know what's happening and they give it the thumbs up or the thumbs down. I mean, first off, we're making it harder for the people to give a thumbs up or thumbs down because we have anti-majority systems like gerrymandering and the Electoral College and so on. Right. But then the information is also broken between Facebook, Fox News, OAN, all these things. So, you know, we have, I mean, the, even the most basic definitions of democracy, I think we have structural problems with in the United States. I don't think the UK is any sort of pristine, perfect no. system by any means, but I, I will say that like, when you tune into even the Murdoch-owned Sky News uh, in the UK, it, it's, it's a normal broadcast. I mean, it's That's, just totally yeah, normal. Yeah. Uh, it, and, and it's, I go on there, it's a fair question. The hmm. discussion is truth-based. Um, See, that's what I'm getting at. They can't radicalize the way a Sean Hannity can or some of these guys without, you know, Tucker Carlson with, you know, with no consequences. We're talking about there need to be consequences. This is why I prefer your system. Or the system of the country you're in. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I and I think I think it's a, a very fair point of view. I mean, I, my my worry in the United States is that if you impose that now, there's already a, such a toxic cycle that it would just feed. You know, it's like this is one of the things why I, I know I was giving you reasons why we can't fix things, John. But it's one of the reasons why I am quite pessimistic is that the victimhood complex that's central to Trumpism means yeah. that any sort of effort to reform the system right. feeds into the victimhood complex because they say, oh, they're using them. the state against right. us or they're, they're regulating the right. media or whatever it is. So even right. if you're saying, no, we're just trying to make it so you have, you can't lie. 
They'll say, oh, right. you're just trying to silence conservatives. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, that's why the genie is out of the bottle in a way that's very difficult to put it back in. But, you know, I'm hopeful over the long term. I, Despite the fact that I interviewed a lot of really awful people for this book and a lot of my work <laughs> associated with terrible things, hmm. I, I actually believe human nature is generally good. And I think that over the course of decades, the United States will get back, back on track, but it's going to be a long road. Who's the worst dictator you interviewed? Well, I mean, form, I, I use the term despot for this guy because uh, he, he was in, in Thailand. Um, uh, he's an interesting case because his name's Abhisit Vejajiva. I've <laughs> met with him several times. And he used live rounds on protesters um, during, well, oversaw it anyway. It's, it's not right. certain that he gave the order. But o- almost 100 people were killed Um <laughs> And I, I've had breakfast with him a few times. Uh, there's a guy I talk about early on in the book who was the the yogurt kingpin of Madagascar, who um, ended up becoming quite corrupt. He was the president um, for just under a decade and was overthrown by a radio disc jockey who was 34 years old. It's quite a hmm. colorful story. But he, From yogurt he, to radio, huh? What did you say? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the yogurt kingpin to the radio DJ. And he he grew more corrupt over time. But of course... I mean, being in power in Madagascar requires you to do some pretty ugly stuff. So there's there's people like this. Um, I interviewed uh, a former cult leader um, who is the worst bioterrorist in U.S. history. Uh, if you've seen the documentary Wild Wild Country, it's about uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh's cult in Oregon oh. in the 1980s. Oh, I know. I know about Definitely. him. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember the and name. So I, yeah, so I interviewed Ma Anand Sheila, who was his right-hand woman, <laughs> the sort of um, and she orchestrated the poisoning of a thousand people with salmonella. Uh, and the thing that's super weird about her, and this is why, you know, one of the things I go into in the book is she's now in charge of a care home for people with disabilities, mental disabilities in Switzerland. That's where I met her. Wow. And she hasn't done anything bad since. And it's the worst bioterrorist. Did she serve in prison Switzerland. time for it? Yeah, she was in prison for four years and then got deported. And, and the wow. thing is, you know, she, she to me really, I use her in the chapter on power corrupts because as she got closer to this cult leader and sort of became the voice of God, because he took a vow of silence and and she started to speak on behalf of the cult leader. um, She started to orchestrate assassination plots, all sorts of stuff. I mean, she was going to kill a U.S. attorney. And then now she's in charge of a care home where there's schizophrenics and so on who are very, you know, dependent on her. And she's had a pristine record. And that stuck with me because it was like, you know, maybe this is something to do with the psychology of power. If this person was like one of, I mean, the worst, literally the worst bioterrorist in American history now is in charge of vulnerable people. I mean, it's, it's an amazing story. So. But it is, I I think we forget that sometimes, you know, and that to me is where the evolution comes in Mm -hmm. is that you can run into people out here who can be the nicest people in the world to your face. I often think what you brought up of the folks who are getting together and, and almost like having, not almost, they're having picnics while they were lynching. Yeah. African Americans in the South, and it was this happy event. Everybody being really nice to each other. <clears throat> Once you 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 successfully dehumanized whoever you're doing this to yeah. in a way, then then you can still feel like you're you know like we have this we have the incredible you know good and incredible evil. It's, I think it's a spectrum inside of all of us. Yeah, mm. but that's know. what worries me is I worry that people like her. She wasn't reformed. She has both sides, and maybe yeah. a lot of us have both sides, which is a Harry Potter line, by the way. Remember, Harry's getting very upset about sort of the, everything going on. And he says, you know, it's not what's inside of you. It's it's sort of it's the choices you made about what is inside of you. See, you know? everything comes back to where Brian's sitting right now. And that's that's what I was thinking country. to England. But no, but it's true, though. Like it's but it's also a little creepy, though, to think that somebody like her, maybe a lot of people like Cliff said, they're very nice people. And at the same time, they're horrible people. It's, I've often thought that way. Like, what if Hitler know. had been successful in his art? Who the hell knows? Right. Yeah. Like, uh, I mean. Yeah, I, I, I talk about this actually in the book because I, I one of the weirder things I did was I took a ski lesson with Paul Bremer, uh, the guy who <laughs> ran Iraq in 2003. He's now a ski instructor in Vermont. Get out. Um, That's so funny. So, Are you kidding yeah. me? <laughs> no, so he's, yeah, he's a ski instructor in Vermont. So I flew out and I took a ski lesson with him and then I interviewed him on the chairlift and so on. Oh, funny. And, um, you know, I, I use his story because he was one of these guys who he served as an ambassador to like Malawi, Norway, all these places just pristine record, right? Did really, really well. And then right after he arrived in Iraq, one of the things that he floated as a proposal was shooting looters who were stealing TVs, right? Just to send a message that law and order was back. And the point he said to me, which, you know, he's he's right about is he's like, this just wasn't 
the United States. I, could, I couldn't pretend like I was ruling the United States. And so the rules changed. Now, it's not to absolve this, right? I, I wouldn't countenance shooting looters. But it is to say, like, when you are thrust into a totally different system, he inherited a dictatorship, right? He was woken up by uh, mortars every morning with people trying to kill him. He was blown up by an IED, his convoy was, while he was you know, trying to bring electricity back to the country. And he was just saying to me, he's like, okay, well, this wasn't Norway anymore. So hmm. I had to face choices that I would never have considered in a million years in a good system. And I think we sometimes forget that, that there are people around yeah. the world, you know, if you're the dictator of Turkmenistan, good luck staying in power unless you're willing to do some awful things. Now, again, you don't absolve it. You just use the lesson to understand that it's not just the people. And I think we, we sometimes just say the politicians are awful and we don't think about the culture or the system around them. We need to do much more of that, I think. The system corrupts. Absolutely. The system could corrupt as well. It's yeah. just easier to demagogue and to sort of, you know, blame a person or whatever, as opposed to looking at the you know the situation yeah yeah all right well wow. this is great brian um book again corruptible brian class kla class k-l-a-s um and i assume <laughs> it's on sale everywhere at this point right it is yes indeed in the united states it comes out in the uk in january but yeah it's in the oh, u.s uh-huh. well i'm <laughs> grabbing a copy for the holidays here i can't wait and it sounds fascinating so oh, thank you cool brian well thank you so much this was fabulous thanks a hey, lot thanks brian. for having me on i appreciate it yeah it was okay. really nice to to chat Thanks, man. Okay. Absolutely. Take care. Talk Bye. to you later. Bye bye. Thanks again. Bye. And there we go. Oops. Ah, well, that was good. Oh, very interesting. Yeah, so, okay, folks, that's where you get that's where you get Brian's book. Um, I don't know anything else to add. Though that does, I mean, it's sad. I guess it doesn't surprise me, but it saddens me because it worries me. This this gets more to the Hannah Hannah Arendt thing and banality of evil and everything else. That like, if yep. if evil isn't just evil people, but it's kind of could be everybody or at least half of everybody, <laughs> you know, then it's going to be a lot harder to fix. If well, what was the book, you know, what was the book that I brought up before Ordinary Germans? And, you know, I don't remember. What, is it tell, what is that again? Just, I think it's called Ordinary Germans. Uh, I'm trying to remember who wrote it. I could look Ordinary it up. Ordinary people of Germany. How, Mary Tyler Moore. No, right, like but Ava these, Braun, these yeah. regular everyday folks. But then when, when, the, the, when they were being told to do awful things, they thought that that was, the, you know, they kind of yeah. thought, well, I'm part of this and yeah. that absolved them and they did it. And yeah. under different circumstances, they wouldn't have done it, you know? And right. I mean, it's not, and again, I think as Brian said, I agreed with almost everything Brian said today. It's not that you absolve anybody. It's that <clears throat> if you're being reactionary and you're being kind of like them, if you don't try to understand the complexities behind right. these situations, because there are always, there are extremes. There's always a spectrum. There are people that were never going to be able to turn into decent right. people. Seb Gorka will never be a decent person, no matter right. what system he's in. Don Jr., but I'm quite serious. There's right. a personality there. But yeah. there are plenty of people who have been corrupted by by Trumpism who could be decent people. Right. And that's what you have to try for to, so the center holds in a, right. in a democracy. You've got to figure out the incentive structure. And that's, it's a, I don't know if you call that an economic analysis or what, but, but if the incentives are inviting bad people, creating bad people, elevating right. bad people, turning good people bad or tapping into the bad side of good people, then you've got to change the incentives. But I worry, like we were talking about with Brian, I mean, we can't get shit done, you know, and, and especially like the truth thing and everything else. These guys, we couldn't even deal with a plague, you know? I know. Well, that's why I mean, I'm throwing out, I, I, that, that's yeah. why I'm throwing out this sort of, as like the break cla- glass, break class, just kidding, break glass in, yeah. in case of emergency. Right. I honestly feel like we're at the Kamala Harris option at this point. If, if we cannot get, if we cannot get mansion and cinema to do the right thing. Right. Um, and to allow us to vote on, and really even Lisa Murkowski or Romney or people right. you think would believe in democracy right. to let us, to break a filibuster, you know, um, and let us vote in a way that we need to, um, on some of these bills and say the filibuster is gone and right. we're able to vote on basic, then again, numerous scholars, and you know, again, Nixon did this when he was vice president. The Constitution gives the presiding officer in the Senate the ability oh, to definitely. declare yeah, yeah, yeah. Senate rules <clears throat> unconstitutional. Then they have to have a vote. So you'd still need to hold on to the votes of Cinema and Mansion. You'd have to have them not defect to the other side. Right. But Kamala Harris could do that and they could vote on whether what she said was accurate. We would have the 50 votes plus her vote to do it. Or and get I'm a Republican saying, to cross over, haha. All right. We, I mean, we, we need to do yeah. something because the, yeah. there's, there's like, a, you know, he was talking about circuit breakers, which I think is the way to put it. I can think of three, four ways the media is starting to report accurately, which needs to be pressured. You know, 
the filibuster being eliminated. There's really, at this point, I can only think of a couple ways that we have a chance to remain. Did you see the CNN story today? Um, There's a CNN story out today. Everyone was going, maybe I was last night. Okay, just to put in context here, the infrastructure bill was signed on Monday, three days ago. The CNN story is about Americans are not seeing any benefit from Biden's most historic, biggest accomplishment. It's been three fucking days. You're not going to see any benefit in three days because like literally it's not like the money turns into a bridge in three days. But but this is just, you know, no. And that's why the media making the media, you know, better is a longer term project getting rid of the filibuster, you know, and that will help because people will get more accurate information. As he said, you know, the, the, the folks need to have informed consent. And if they're not informed properly, they yeah. can't <clears throat> consent to a democracy. Yeah. That has to be changed. But that's a longer term project. That's yeah. stuff, you know, which we can pressure over six months, a year, three years, yeah. whatever. The filibuster has to be eliminated now. And like... Yeah. Well, you know what? We're, we're it's the, the doomsday and, clock hitting midnight. But this gets us back to the to the messaging argument. We need to have... We need to have January 6th of the messaging argument. I mean, meaning we need to have some kind of bomb go off, except metaphorical bomb on the Democratic Party so that people go, Jesus freaking Christ, we've got to change this messaging problem. It is ridiculous. We talk about it all the time and it makes no Mm -hmm. freaking sense. And whether it means some strong man, woman has to come into power among Democrats that slaps them all into line, but says no more. We are going to message like Republicans. And it doesn't mean lying, but it means beating the Fuck no, out well, of you. Well, and there was a unified. yesterday. It's they ridiculous. all were freaking we can't out. Without that. They all were freaking out. You brought up interesting about Swalwell when you had him on here. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and they all, you know, Lauren Boebert went after him and lied about him and this whole Chinese oh, yeah. spy thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. not going to repeat it all because it's yeah. just garbage. Yeah. And it's funny, Kathy Griffin, who I know you're a fan of, yeah. um, responded and said, she's like, she was sort of like, geez, why are they? She's like, they're all so obsessed with you. Yep. you know, to Swalwell on this thread on Twitter. And I responded to it. And I was like, the reason they're so obsessed with obsessed with him is because he tells the truth as often and as effectively yep. as they lie. Yep. And and that's the truth of it. Is it he aggressively goes them. after them? What? Pete Buttigieg. They yes. went after him again a few days ago with, a, she, yep. with another homophobic attack. He, he's another one. They, but they all, and they all unified, in, uh, real quick, but they all unified in the last month to go after Buttigieg on all the networks and everything yep. else. And it's been, and I keep going, why? No, the gay thing, they like that they think homophobia No, works, that's just an opportunity for them. There's The reason is, he is, is when they see people on our side who are going to be as aggressive as they are, get in their faces, destroy yep. them, and have the facts at hand to do it. Yep. They get nervous and they go after those people. Bingo. You were we, saying and, something and we, else. What was the other person? Well, we're, I said Ted Lieu. Oh, Ted Lieu. Yeah, exactly. yeah, he's another we need, yeah. we need every Democrat to be as aggressive and as and as as eloquent in their aggressiveness and telling the truth and going after these guys and pointing out when they're lying yeah. as mm-hmm. those three. I mean, just yesterday, another one of these clowns in the House whose name I can't remember because he's mm-hmm. just some basic Republican generic idiot mm-hmm. tried to take credit you know, for some of the money coming back to his district that he voted against in the infrastructure. Oh, I saw that. Yes, I and saw that. And Swalwell yeah, yeah, yeah. retweeted it and, and ripped him. He's like, oh, you mean the money that you voted against that you're yeah. now trying to... Where's that aggressiveness from everybody else? Yeah. You know, yeah. where's that yeah. sort of point, you know, and yeah. that's the thing we need. Yeah, yeah. No, and but again, I think we we need to cause some kind of a blow up over this. Whether we start, we unify more and more people just to bitch at Democrats about it. I don't know what, but I do worry that it's it's a movement problem too. We've got... I've always kind of, it's ironic, as much as people like to talk about intersectionality, which I think is just a buzzword, there is no intersectionality. People who talk about intersectionality care about their issue and they want to win their issue by having your grassroots support them. That has always been my theory. It's not, it's not that they care about your issue. So there isn't this, this uniform yeah. we care about. Sure, we care about everything, all of you listening. Yeah, right, of course. But but everyone's got their fiefdom and that's the only message they want to push and the only thing, and they still suck at it. I mean, you know, there's, so, there's obviously Come some on. truth to that. Because, How hard is it because to sell on the climate change, Give me because a break. they're united yeah. on everything on the right, even things they yeah. don't give a damn about because they get it. It's for their, it's for yeah. the entire. They're playing for the ball game. Yeah, you know, yeah. and we're playing for, and we're not only are we playing for each individual piece separately, but we suck at the messaging. And I say climate, climate change. Come on, like guns, Cliff. Climate change and guns should have been the easiest fucking argument to win ever. Give me a break. Yeah. How fucking hard is guns, especially? How freaking hard is it to win an argument when every month some school kid's getting shot up? Give me a break. That's a note. That's easy to win. I well, really what you say should that. be calling what well, you should That's be calling ridiculous. assault rifles. Assault rifles are child murder weapons. There you go. There you go. Yeah. 
I would call them that every day. Yeah. But no, it's, I have it actually is, quite often called them that. Yeah. But it's not like anybody's echoing me on that. Baby so, killers, you know. Cliff. Baby killers. Yeah. How exactly. about that? For, how about that? If you take the abortion word and turn it around? Not no, that. I agree. Take baby killers. Back. Walmart is selling baby killers. Oh, my God. I mean, <laughs> but we don't, we, we, we just. Because we're, you know, oh, that would be improper and mean. Yeah. Well, so actually, what was know. were we talking about on the show the other day? But somebody was saying where they got, or we talked with one of our guests or somebody where they were saying you get into the issue of, well, that wouldn't be technically correct. Was I talking about this with you? Were we talking about on the show? You weren't, but I wouldn't be surprised. Oh, or maybe it was something on Twitter, but somebody was raising the point, and that's what they said. But on our side, we kind of go, well, that wouldn't be exactly correct. What was? Oh shit, I'm trying to remember. It was some issue we were talking about, and just that that the guy was or woman I was talking to. Well, was I like, just had it to me happen to me yesterday whole, too because yeah, because I was going to bring it up with Brian, but but we had so many things we wanted to talk about. He yeah. brought, you know, we're talking about gerrymandering, and the Senate here just voted to adopt the state Senate this ridiculous map that gives in a state that Republicans. <laughs> have a 53 to 54%, you know, to 46, 47% right. advantage to give them 13 of the 15 house seats. Oh, Jesus Christ. In this, and Jesus my Christ. response was, so I responded to that on Twitter and I say, they literally just stole my vote. Yeah. I have no vote for Congress now because yeah. they've thrown me into a district. Me and my neighbors are a district with somebody who has nothing in common. And yeah. I literally had Democrats and liberals like, well, they didn't technically take your vote oh. away. I'm like, <laughs> you know, like, you know, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. Cliff, the gun isn't fucking... technically a baby killer because it kills exactly. more than babies and it sometimes doesn't kill at all. But I mean, I kid you not. I wish I could remember the example because somebody was telling me and I said, oh, my God, this is what we talk about all the time. They were trying to convince people to use some phrase. And the group, that, the liberal group they were working with was like, well, but you've got to understand technically it could be this and this. And we're like, message the goddamn fucking point. John, oh my God. We're the Judean people's front, not the people's front of Judea. Exactly. The only thing we hate worse than the Romans are the people's front of Judea. Yeah. No, it's, it's, but, but again, we need to have, I, I think, and it's not just we've got to create our own Fox News. We've got very bad people messaging. And we asked Paul Begala and everybody else. And, and they always say, I don't know. When, I mean, not their fault, but I mean, we always say, why the hell can't we? Everybody recognizes this is a problem, but we can't fix it. And we all go, ugh. Pick the three or four people, the Swalwell, the Lou, the whatever, who are best at it, oh. and let them handle it for but us. But you know what, Cliff? Maybe we have to recognize what Brian just said. Maybe the system we've got somehow in democratic politics is, is creating this messaging problem. It's the system. It's not the wrong – it's not just the wrong people. Maybe well, the way the DNC is structured, the way, right? the way our party well, is structured. We, I'll just put yeah. it this way without going – You know, you see some of the very same people – handling and i've been on the inside there on both the pr side and the tv ad side you see them hiring some of the very same people over and over again and let's just say they're not always the best equipped to be doing this kind of work no absolutely but but i mean but also the system in terms of the way congress works the way the dnc works somehow but that's em- part of the system we empower the promoting to do it right we empower the fiefdoms we empower this messaging today changing messaging yesterday even I'm sorry, Build Back Better, I think was a ridiculous name for Biden's program. It confused me at the beginning. It's st- I still find it cringeworthy. I do. I, I think we have sucky messaging. And maybe maybe in that case, I don't know who came up with it and why Biden would have agreed. But somebody he trusts. You know what would have been the it? easiest in the world, if you huh. think about it? Huh? Because it would Bridges be based on the movie, and... the partially the planes, trains, and automobiles. Oh, the, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That's fucking brilliant. The plane, Thank trains, you. and automobile bill. And by the way, it also ends up being PTA, which is funny too because it's schools. <laughs> right. The PTA Why bill, the PTA that? bill, because it's planes, trains, and automobiles and schools. It was a John Hughes movie who I think sadly God. passed away. John Candy sadly passed away. But I have a feeling that Steve Martin, who is still with us, would wholly endorse our calling it the planes, trains, and automobiles bill. Hell, you could probably even get him to do an ad. He's a Democrat and he's a supporter of you know like. I mean, I just I don't get why we have to make everything more difficult. Yeah. Build back better. And as I said, I didn't even know the Medicare stuff was in there until now, maybe two months ago. We do a we always do a shitty job selling stuff. I just well, the planes, trains, and automobiles bill would be the name of it. And then as we've talked about, you'd look and you'd poll and you'd pick out the three to five most popular things. Right. And that might differ a little bit if you're talking to the elderly, yeah. or you're talking to younger folks, rural folks, whatever. But, Cliff, but, but overall, be... yeah, overall yeah. you'd have at least two or three things that are the most popular among everybody. And but maybe you can't an additional call it thing. That maybe, because Medicare just... is popular, but we can't talk about Medicare if it's plane, trains, and automobiles, Cliff. That name doesn't work. Technically. Yeah. Technically. 
Right. Right. No, you, you know, know what I'm saying, right? You understand what I'm saying, right? Like there's the three things that appeal to everybody. And then there's yeah. the national broadband in yeah. the rural area that you, yeah. you add on there. And there's the certain thing you add on with parents with young kids, child tax. When credit, you go to each state and visit, you can tailor it. But right. you're right. You've, you've got the Muslim ban and the Mexico wall for your issue. You have the two things that resonate and everybody hears it. And that's what you talk about 25 times a day. Yeah, Mexico's right. paying for the planes, trains, and automobile bill. Even better, foreigners right. are going to pay for it. And you I say mean, America first, and you say nationalism, and everybody gets that when you're saying those yeah. broader themes, yeah. that includes the things you're oh, talking God. about. Oh, God, Cliff, America first. We could have, we should have, I would have fucking used the term America first and said what America first means is paying for planes, trains, and automobiles. It means investing in America, which they never did, right? They invested yes. in you themselves. you turn that back on them. Yeah. Right. They invested in themselves. Now we're really seeing America for, and you know what? And finally, after four years of squalor, we're finally making America great again. I swear to God, I would use, and I don't care what people say, I would use every fucking word against them and watch their back up against the wall. Again, of course go after right. their strength. Say, you didn't make America great again. You made the Trumps great again. You made rich people great again. You made Donald Don Jr. great and rich again. Actually, right. You made the Trumps rich again. You didn't make America great again. Now we're making I mean, America great again. I mean, I have to believe some of the loudest Ugh. mouths in the Senate, some of the loudest mouths among these billionaires who become incredibly unpopular, Elon Musk. Right. Like, use the, these folks against them, but we don't. Yeah. The weirdos who are on their side, the loud mouths who are on I mean, I, Well, you know what I was thinking about, too, actually? <clears throat> I don't know why this came to me yesterday, but I was thinking about um, how – I forgot what I was thinking about this way. How they're able to sort of go after us. And, and I mean, we talked about this before, but I forgot in what context yesterday I was thinking of it. You know, the AOC thing or whatever. They've got so many lunatics on their side. We don't even have, I mean, I, I'm hard pressed to find lunatics. There's a couple of members I really don't AOC like. AOC even, but, they can't make well, work as lunatic. much as they want to. She's not. Well, but, but they she, make it better she, than we do demonizing their right. No, I know they do because That's they what work I mean. on it. That's what I mean. Yeah. There's, they have got so many crazies on their side, and we do such a shitty job of of dude. And frankly, they're, they're, it looks like they're going to win again. So currently, just they're going to win. Congress just again. Gosar, Green, Bobert, and Bobert. Cawthorn. Maybe yeah. you want to add a fifth, also. That's fucking idiot, Gomer. And Getz. they should accompany or Getz. They should now those four or five should accompany everything we say about yes. Republicans. Yes, that should be the we should turn that yeah. should be the face of everything we do against yes. them. Yes, yes. And for the I don't care year, if you're running it. in some moderate district mm -hmm. in Westchester right. County, New York, or in Los Angeles yeah. on the Republican side, and you're you're a Republican who's pro-choice or whatever. This is your party. Yeah. And you, you know what? I would I would go and get, guess what the critique of this will be? Lauren Boebert, chairman of the Armed Services Committee. Right. Well, technically, because of her rank, she wouldn't get the chairwomanship. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I mean, but no, you're you're absolutely right, though. That's and, and frankly, that is the message for the next. Well, OK, that's the message. And then you still have to have the two or three positive messages about what. By, and by the way, I again heard this on CNN because they were saying, you know, most voters feel the polls show that Biden hasn't really accomplished anything. And then we're and then the new CNN story saying this bill hasn't. You know why? Because how often have Democrats talked? Cliff, I had to think back of when it was and what was in those early bills on COVID passed during Biden. I was like, I know. I, my nephew mentioned to me, he goes, I got a mailing about a, another stimulus check. What is this? Pay, well, I, mean, I, what I barely I, remember at this point what the hell was in the damn. There were stimulus checks under Biden. Who I remembers know. that? I would literally went, oh, that's true. The paycheck protection. There was a tranche of paycheck protection earlier this year too, I think. And I was like, oh, that's true. That was under Biden. We don't it's the stimulus bill all over again with Obama. We don't even fucking talk about what Biden did I know. with those first couple bills for the, for the economy, the childcare stuff for the stimulus. I mean, the unemployment, the unemployment uh, think correction they did helped everybody. You don't have to pay taxes on the first 10 or 20,000 of the unemployment you got uh, under the COVID thing. You don't owe taxes now because of Biden. They don't talk about any of this shit. And we wonder why we lose. We win, we move on. And even I am sitting there going, wait, now what bill was that? <laughs> when was that? No, that I know. Was, that well, was you don't know the po you, you, All you do is you see the squabbling as the media is covering it. And you, you, you don't know the positive you've gotten from stuff they've already done. And then you hear the negative side from Republicans about yeah. how they're all baby killing, yeah. you know, climate change obsessed, <sighs> blah, 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 trying to socialist world order, yeah. this, that. Yeah. Then who are you going to vote for? If you but don't you, know any, if that's all you know. Reminding them of what we've done, and I, 
Uh, in simple oh talking points, like oh literally bullet pointed language. It's that easy. And over and over and over and over fucking again. And then over and then over again. But seriously, though, everyday Biden's people I, and Biden and everything, we, whatever. Fuck, I don't I want to say fuck them, but I'm just so fucking frustrated with Democrats. They're terrible. And it's not again. This is the problem, though. It, and it's it's it is. This is not about reinforcing ant, uh, antagonism or animus towards the Democratic Party. This is the entire fucking movement, folks. I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Everybody, almost everybody sucks at messaging. <laughs> this isn't just pol- political leaders. She said the groups suck at messaging too. Everybody, almost we, we everybody just, sucks at messaging. We Again, need to be better. Not you know, all. guns and climate. I, I'm sorry, I'll say it. Easy, easy. Cli- climate got harder now because they, you know, when polar bears were drowning, climate was a, a win, but pff, oh, whatever. They didn't want to, you know, I remember bringing that issue up too. Oh, polar bears. You know, we've talked about that before. Like the, the big story this that year was polar bears were literally drowning. Now, whether it was true or not in retrospect, who knows? I don't care. But that the ice little patches were melting that they usually float on. And they would yeah, take refuge. I remember. On, remember on an ice patch? I'm telling for people though. They would take refuge on, when they're swimming and they could no longer take refuge on little floating ice patches like the like the people leaving the island of Misfit Toys so that they were literally paddling and drowning. Yeah, and they're drowning. Like, right. What a fucking, and the gun thing, easy peasy to win on that issue. Well, I don't even understand why we started calling it oh. climate change. Climate change sounds okay. Global warming sounds bad. I don't get it either. Well, because Cliff, I think I know why. Because actually there's warming and there's cooling, depending what happens. I don't I call know. It, you know what I would do? I'd yeah. call it global burning. Well, call it that. Exactly. Exactly. Climate change. You're right about that. Climate change. Like I live in Chicago. I like climate changes. You want to refer to climate? <laughs> call, it, call, it, call it climate death. <laughs> Something, but but climate change. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. Actually, it, it is more global. I mean, it's more uh, it's more gradual too. Climate change, it's just changing. Oh, yeah, okay. just changing a little bit. I mean, it's a little more. It, it makes you feel like, oh, yeah. it's a little more temperate out there today. That's yeah. nice. It's also pollution too. Frankly, that the concern is the pollution. So pollution well, is pollution. Is really, like, nobody Polluted likes pollution. oceans, lack of water. No, but I'm saying CO two is pollution too. Nobody nobody likes pollution really. And and we were talking about a global pollution problem that was killing the well. Basically, those would also be under the overall narrative then of the of something like you know global burning or whatever you want to call it. Then you'd have your three or four yeah. message points about the yeah. oceans being destroyed and yeah. see you know and the pollution and the but yeah we fit critical mass on global pollution. I'm exhausted and just even talking about it because it should be this hard. Oh my god. Okay, I need to go have my second cup of coffee. Okay, guys, I got that was actually, else. <laughs> that was good though. He's wonderful. Yeah, he's great. He's great. So get the book, Corruptible. Um, And Cliff and I will see you next week. Sorry about last week. We missed the second one. Last week, but, you know, we gave you an hour and a half today. So We took a break. I know. We We, 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 We we were on a break. We give and we take away. We're on a break. We're on a break. (laughs) We're on a break. All right, guys. Next week. Take care. Aloha.